How much of that, when you're at top of a run, is mental? And what are kind of some of the things that are running through your head as you do them? I'd say 99% is mental when you're standing at the start. You just hope physically that you're fine. I think it's everything. When it comes down to those big moments, like how much is it really, you know, the talent side of things, or is it really like the mental edge? They score! Haley Irwin on the deflection! It's tied at one! You gotta have the eye of the tiger. Burris back to pass. Has the man! Has the touchdown! And now he is number three all time! You don't worry about the outcome, you worry about the process. What separates you at this level is, is, is six inches between your ears and how much time you put there. Dunnigan fakes inside, steps up, throws deep for Daryl Smith. He's got a touchdown. Into the corner, now forced back behind another tomorrow. Oh, that's a diving shot, score! McBean and Heddle going for the medal, trying to roll their way into history. Loose punch. Leg kick. Oh, and he hits him hard with a oh, shot. Yeah, he's got him rocked. Dropped him. And a drive to deep right field. Back towards the wall. It's gonna go. First home run of the big leagues for Josh Naylor. It's a two-run shot. This Telfer puts it in, and that's the opening goal. And Pauli didn't do his job. And a handoff to Ford. He has never scored a touchdown. He's got his first. <laughs> The payoff pitch. He struck him out with the high fastball. Three strikeouts in the first. The first five years of my career, I played in the minor leagues and I did not have a mental game at all. And uh, I learned from some of the veteran players that I played with in the minor leagues. But I had an aha moment when I was in the spring training, and it was a guy named Mark Eichhorn, who was a relief pitcher that I played with. He said, I said, how'd you do? He said, I was wild. I said, how many guys you walk? He said, I haven't walked anyone. He said, I was wild in the zone. And I remember driving home that day from the ballpark thinking, man, I am looking at this the entirely the wrong way. So I, from that day forward, I started to really focus on hitting the ball, hitting my spots. Not that I didn't know it was important, but it just was that aha moment for me. So the mental part of it was a huge factor for me, it changed my life. The more important the game was, the more I thought about the game and what needs, to, what I needed to do to help the team win. Throughout my career, mentally, I was always strong. And that's why I think I played so long, because I was strong mentally. Because I'm not strong physically. I'm not fast, not big. So I had to be mentally stronger than you. The average athlete might spend uh, like 30 hours training a week, uh, physically. and But then the mental component gets left behind. Really when you're at the high level, like the difference between like a good performance and a great performance really is like the uh, the mental the mental game because you're going through the routine of what you're doing before, doing a bit of imagery um, and getting feedback from your coach and, and working through that. You know for me I, I don't think at a young age I understood the mental side. The same way I didn't understand the physical side, the nutritional side. Um, I think that comes later in your career, and much later, I think, than you probably realize. That's working with our sports psych, right? Like, those are things that we legitimately talk about. What if? And we give ourselves all these scenarios, and we work through them, we talk through them, and we mentally go through them so that when they do happen, or if they do happen, we're prepared. Our sports psychologist taught me this when I was in the big leagues. It was find something red in the stands. Uh, anytime you have a negative thought, he told me, find something red in the stands and think about a red thong. So I would step off the mound, I would back off, I would find, and there's always something red in every stadium, Budweiser, flag. So I would step off the mound and I would find something red and then I'd get right back on the mound, get the sign and try to go at the task. And that's just hit the glove. The biggest thing too is when you go out there and you're warming up, it's like, am I gonna have my good curveball today? Am I gonna have my good fastball? Because many, many times I pitched where I didn't have either. 
that's a part of being a martial artist is you're striving to be perfect, but you're never going to be perfect. So you're always getting better every single day. It's just a lot of anxiety, honestly. Like you, it's, you're getting into a fight. I'll be in the locker room. I'll be like, oh my God, why did I get myself into this? Why did I, like, I'll literally say like, why the, why the hell do, am I doing this right now? I don't need to be doing this. But afterwards, after you win, it's such a relief. A lot of people think anxiety is a negative thing, but I think it's a good thing because if I didn't have anxiety, then that means I wouldn't care. And if I didn't care, then that means I wouldn't be training um, as hard as I possibly could. In 1998 in Nagano in Japan, my fourth Olympics, uh, you talked about how long do we prepare? Well, I kept this in my pocket for six months and it was the uh, Olympic gold medal and it was in the Toronto Star. And uh, I know what it says on it, but it says on it, I don't even have to read it because I had it in my pocket for six months. Uh, Nagano gold, Japanese mint display shows both sides of the gold medal to be awarded at the 1998 Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan. And so that was my goal to win this medal. So it was a reminder for me every time I put my hand in my pocket, whether I was wearing jeans like this or a pair of shorts working out or ski pants, I'd have that in my pocket. And it was a reminder of me to remember what I wanted to do on that day, uh, which was win a gold medal for Canada. Are you uh, superstitious at all? I'm superstitious, yeah. So, uh, th like, I've got some stupid ones. You know, athletes try not to admit they have superstitions. <laughs> it's like we just have routines. I, I hate to call them superstitions. I, I think you you call them um, tendencies that you would you tend to do a certain thing. I kept everything the same way. I pretty much ate the same foods. I woke up, read the same books, did the same things. I don't think I was very superstitious. But I tried to do the same things over that was successful for me on that, those particular games. My day on a game day was a complete ritual until the game was over. And then I could go and eat chicken wings and drink beer with the guys. So I keep it pretty simple. I, just, I usually just wake up, um, listen to music and, and have a, meal, usually pasta and chicken before. That, that's the one thing that stays the same, the pasta and chicken before the game, so. Like, I, I'll have a coffee before every fight. I'll have to go in physically, um, order my black coffee with an espresso shot in it. I definitely got dressed the same way every time, uh, left and right, left and right. When I woke up in the morning, uh, from what I ate to, to the way I went to the rink, everything was just a routine from start to finish. What else do I do? Um, that depends on my previous games, to be honest. So, like, if I go for four and I'm wearing batting gloves, I may not wear them today. Or I may wear a different pair. Or uh, I may ask a friend for theirs, uh, whoever got the most hits the last game. I needed to have a glass of red wine the night before I competed. It was, like, a superstition. I knew that it didn't really have anything to do with how I was going to compete, but it was just my my feeling that it made me feel ready. And if I didn't have the glass of red wine, I was like, oh, I'm not going to have a good performance. I would talk to people in the mornings, but once I got there for the game that night, I wasn't talking to anybody. I was stretching on my own. I didn't, I wouldn't talk to the doctors. I wouldn't talk to my teammates. I, and even at home after the morning skate, I didn't even talk to my family. I just went home, ate, went, had my nap, got up, went to the rink. It makes it a little bit difficult when you're competing in a dry country like, like Qatar <laughs> and trying to illegally sneak like alcohol in, but, um, but that was my, my thing that I, I like to do. Oh, one routine we had in Calgary, my running back was Kelvin Anderson, who's now a Hall of Famer. And we had this unspoken thing from the first game that we played together where we were across the dressing room from each other and he was starting to pull his jersey on and he asked me to give him a hand with his pads. And literally we did not play a game after that for five years where where I didn't pull his jersey over his pads for him. Like he wouldn't let anybody else touch him. If somebody else came to help him, he would kind of say, no, I got it. And that was kind of the cue for me to, to get up and go give him a hand. So usually I'll fight like um, far away. So I'll, I'll be in a hotel room and I have to have the bed closest to the door for some reason, I don't know. I remember giving my glove away to a kid in the first, first row above the dugout after I got knocked out of a game. And I remember thinking, you know, that, that glove was out of wins. So that was very superstitious thought, actually. So, you know, I think we all are, and we all have a little bit of a, a window of superstition. The game's like this when you first start off. It's like that, right? It's just going 1,000 miles an hour, and then it starts doing this, and then it starts doing this. And then it's when you break in the huddle and you're on top of your game, it's like this. 
It's like, <laughs> you guys are screwed. My dad, at a young age, he always told me that proper, proper preparation prevents a piss poor performance. I always do my notes on the start of that day and every reliever who I'm probably gonna face, so mainly righties. So I would specifically make sure I knew who all the righties were and what they do, what their weaknesses were, what they do in certain counts, just stuff like that. There's a lot of analytics stuff you have to go over because you're, you're probably gonna get that pitch in that count. The other one was uh, the confidence. You were just laying in bed the night before going over the Oriole lineup and thinking to yourself, okay, Brady Anderson out, Elbert Bell out, uh, you know, Palmero out, Alomar out. That's the feeling you want, an invincibility of um, being a Rambo and ready for any situation, being able to shove it down their throats and making them like it. And when you get everybody feeling that, breaking the huddle the same way, with that same confidence, it's a pretty powerful feeling. So I had the course drawn on the ceiling of my bedroom. So when I woke up in the morning, it was the first thing I'd see, I'd think about it. And when I fell asleep at night, I'd think about it and try and dream about that. And it was just a simple eight by tens cut out of my ceiling, pasted together in the map of the course with certain you know, things on it, the specific jumps or turns or the names of the course. I remember once I had a coach saying like a, a race is like covering a piece of toast with, with butter, right? So you've got your knife and there's butter on the knife and you want to like perfectly apply so you have butter from crust to crust. You don't want to go like halfway and then all of a sudden you've got like dry toast and you don't want to come off the toast and have all the butter on your knife. So the, the ideal race and the ideal race plan is figuring out how to go like crust to crust and have no butter at the end. And that's like, our, Kathleen and I have actually finished races and we've kind of been like no butter at the end, which is like, it's like the best thing you could possibly have. Right? You know, I was a guy willing to put in the time in the film room and, and, and study the playbook. So therefore mentally I was on top of things. You're just like a game of chess. Football is a game of chess. I'm a big chess player. I love playing the game of chess. Cause therefore, if I can stay two or three moves ahead of you, I've already got you beat. Now you gotta play catch up to me. It's for sure a chess match. Um, essentially, like as soon as you get in there, you're just calculating distance. You're calculating every little move that your opponent makes and making sure that, okay, he's in range for, for a head kick or he's in range for a leg kick. I have to start doing is, is realizing each pitcher I'm facing daily and what they're trying to do with me. And you know, you watch a video for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and you just jot, jot down a few things. And you know, tips that can help you in the box versus that guy, because you know, again, he's the best in the world trying to get you out. Um, he, he, he's trying to get paid before you type of thing. That's the way I think of it. And I like to get paid first. You have to know everybody's position on the football field, defensively and offensively. And it, when the concentration period is 6.30 in the morning, you've got an insertion of plays that you have to know everybody's responsibilities with. So there's no, uh, there's no fucking the dog. There was no going out at night. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was in your dorm room, writing down plays, trying to digest this information so you regurgitate it the next morning. And uh, it got your pee hot. It got your attention, right? You couldn't wait to get there, break the huddle. It's like, oh, Jesus, they're giving us this exactly what we anticipated. It sucks to be you guys. The biggest thing that I tell kids and athletes who want to be the best is prepare. Prepare as much as you can with the knowledge that you have for each and every race because it goes by really, really quickly. <laughs> I was a little unfocused that day. I would made a mistake in the same section I fell on Saturday in a makeup race on Friday and just made a little mistake and I didn't think about it enough that mistake and sure enough I got to that moment on the next day the same spot and made the same mistake but worse and I caught my ski in the net and I broke my pelvis. He's 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 down Stemmel has gone down Brian Stemmel who is coming and uh, they gave me a 50-50 chance of living when they when I got to the hospital and just really really bad but uh, um, what I realized was I should have thought about it a lot more and what I needed to do rather than just, you know, getting up, being a carefree guy and going up and trying to win a race. I was warming up at the track and didn't pay attention, rolled my ankle on like the guardrail and like destroyed my ankle. Like it's in that moment, it's like, you know, like your Olympic dream has like just been like really disadvantaged. It sucks. <laughs> Injuries suck. Uh, unfortunately, they're part of being an athlete. And I've been through too many. Um, and I, I think I learned more and more about myself through every injury. And as crazy as this is going to sound, I, I tried to find the positive in it. 
the scariest thing about it is that you can put in all the work and have a comeback and maybe not make the roster. And so the real question was, was I willing to take that risk? Was it worth it for me? And the answer is yes, because for me, to have the opportunity to maybe wear the Canadian jersey and to represent Canada is a no-brainer. Every time I'm going to go chase that and I'm going to go put myself in the best position possible to achieve that goal. The mental side of getting back to sport is uh, never ending, <laughs> actually. It just keeps going on and on and on because you never forget stuff like that. The physical side, even though I lost 50 pounds, I was in the hospital for three months, and it took me a long time to get my strength back. I didn't ski for a year and a half after that. Um, that was nothing compared to dealing with having to put your poles over the wand in Kitzbühel where I'd fallen before and almost killed myself and wanted to do it again for some reason. What's it like getting pulled from a game? That stinks. Yeah, it, the worst is getting booed at home. <laughs> Yeah, or, or cheered when they come and take you out. Same thing. It does hurt, because you feel like you let the city down, you let the fans down, you let the organization down. And uh, it, it is something to overcome. You don't even need to look, you know, you can feel it. Um, you sit there and you go, yeah, I, I should have that one, or yeah, I'm not on it today. And you get the yank, and it, it, it's, a, it's a long skate, you know, to the, to the bench. Um, it's easier to get pulled between periods. You know, you can kind of slide, slide into something, throw a towel around your neck or something and hide in the corner. But to make the skate is, is, is pretty tough. Toronto let me go after I had a pretty good season. I think I led the NHL in shorthanded goals and they didn't, uh, you know, they were, they wanted me to send me to the American League and I, uh, after three full years in Toronto and I refused to go and I said, you know what, just buy me out of my contracts. So I was sitting at, sitting at home wondering what I was gonna do. You know, I look back now, that was some major adversity. You know, I was 27 years old. We had, uh, I was married. I had, uh, you know, mortgage responsibilities. We were looking to have a family, and and that was, you know, at the time very stressful. You know, so for me, in my first year, I think I played three or four out of 18 games. Other than that, I was I was inactive, and I was I was a spectator. And you know, probably the humbling part of it at the time was in Calgary. The players who weren't dressed for the game, we were sitting in the stands. The fans who had bought their tickets and on either side of you, in front of you, behind you. I mean, I, I remember getting in an argument with a guy in the stands one game my first year because he, he's up in the stands and he's ripping our quarterback and he doesn't really realize that some of this guy's teammates are, are sitting right behind him. But at the time, I guess those were, those were the hard times, right? Being, being a professional football player and sometimes not really feeling like part of the team. I was all excited, got called up, I was going to the Quebec Nordiques, last place team. They thought that I could help them. So I got up, I won my first two games, I said, oh, this is pretty good, you know, and then I proceeded to lose my next three and get pulled in two of them, and I was back in the minors. So I went back to the minors and I just felt like I was done. I said, I, I've, I had my chance, I blew it, I, I can't do it, I'm not good enough. So I called my dad, I said, I'm coming home, and he goes, oh, he goes, my dad was a garbage man in Scarborough. He goes, uh, oh good, it's minus 30 here. He says, I can get you a job on here throwing garbage. Come on back home. Okay, everything's fine. I'll stay here and keep playing. And in Canada, in hockey, it's gold or nothing. We know that and we, we, we accept that. And so to stand there and to, to feel so disappointed um, and just, we didn't accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. Yeah, it's, it's a shitty feeling. I don't know another way to say it. Uh, I know that's not probably the best word to use, but it, it's a really shitty feeling, and we, wanna, we wish we were celebrating the gold. Unfortunately, we fell short, and I think that probably will sting forever. It's tough, it's very tough. I mean, you're waiting for the phone to ring for a club um, to, to you know, offer you a trial or, or a contract. Couldn't find another team. I ended up living in my girlfriend at the time's attic uh, in Scotland and then just said, you know what, I can't do this. I came back, came back to Toronto, regrouped. This was back in August when I came home and the league wasn't going to start till, till March, so I had to figure out what I was going to do in the meantime. Um, I, like I said, I picked up a part-time job and just kind of got through the days until the, the soccer started up again, which was fantastic. <laughs> so when I lose, um, 
I'll like I'll be upset for like a week to just okay you know what I'm still in shape I need to get a fight right away just to get that bad taste out of my mouth uh, to me adversity is kind of as like the first step to, to growing um, as a fighter so basically when I lose I have to kind of dwell on okay what did I do wrong um, and kind of leave my ego out of it because otherwise if I could just say, if I just said, okay, well, he got lucky, then I'm not going to get better. I'm not going to grow as a fighter. When I left Dallas to go to Colorado, we had won the cup. Uh, that was stressful because I, I was still looking for a job, but the stress was more, I don't want to be moving my young family now. Now I've got a family. We owned a home in Dallas and I've got to, you know, ask my wife and my children to pick up and move to an area where they're going to know absolutely nobody, change schools. And that, that was difficult. I mean, again, when I was younger, I was told a bunch of stuff, like, you know, certain ways to handle failure. And I had one guy come up to me and say, you know, you got five seconds to let it all out when you get back on the bench. Five seconds, that's it. And, and after that, it's game on. Can you maybe describe what it's like to go through a slump? You know, if I'm sitting here and I tell you, don't think about the color red, don't think about the color red, don't think about the color red, what do you do? You think about the color red, right? You know, it's, it's expectations that you have on yourself that really make the slump you know, come into focus. It's usually like the, the focus seems to shift in the slump, like you're looking more at like like the outcome. I think there was more pressure on a player to score goals uh, because if you don't score now, you're starting to think, I've got to score, I've got to score. Or if you're not getting the ice time, it's, well, I'm not I'm not producing offensively, so I'm not, I'm not scoring goals. Honestly, man, it's especially at like the big league level, it's like, damn, I, I, I don't want to go to the field today because I don't want to not get a hit again, you know. I don't want to fail these guys, and I constantly keep failing you, man. I, I'm like, I'm sorry, and I'm, I'm trying my hardest, but I know I'm doing bad. Uh, it's the worst feeling ever because you just you want to help your team win games, and you want to help, you know, be a part of big moments. And when you're not, it's just like, why the heck am I here? <laughs> and I remember things like in '93. So I'm a world and Olympic champion. I have this title. This is who I am. And in training, uh, it's going terribly. And I remember bawling in the middle of the lake, thinking that I don't really deserve the titles that I have. I was terrible on that day, and I'd been terrible all that week. So part of it was talking to my friends, and now uh, athletes increasingly have mental performance coaches that they talk to about this. And um, that result is not who you are, it's what you did. I, I didn't have that ability to turn it around. I just don't think I had enough self-confidence in me to be able to just shrug off a bad goal or a shrug off that I'm letting the team down. You gotta stick together, you gotta stick to what you're good at. You can't try to change things drastically because that'll just make things worse. It couldn't be the same trick and pony show every single time. People figure that out. So I'd have to find different ways to be successful. So as soon as the team's found a way to stop what I was doing, I had to try something else. You learn something about yourself. Winning can only teach you so much. Losing teaches you so much more. This whole idea of mental strength, I think, comes from normalizing the path. I think mental strength comes from um, people getting to be their, their true and genuine self. I understand what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. So I try to put myself in a position to do things that I'm good at. Like, I'm not good at expressing myself. So I'm nervous doing this. It's more straining doing this than going to play in front of, you know, 15,000 people. That was one of my biggest anxieties. Every summer I'd go to camp thinking, oh my gosh, have I done enough? Am I ready to go? Am I gonna be in good enough shape? Am I gonna pass the physicals? Am I, am I gonna be able to do you know, the, the, the mountains and the skates and all this other stuff? So that one was a tough summer. I think that's the biggest disappointment is when you lose, um, it, like you almost feel bad that you let your, fam your family down, your friends down, who are all there to support you. Your friends and family will all say, okay, like we don't care that you lost, whatever, but deep down you know that you disappointed them, so it, it sucks. The thing I learned when I was a single sculler um, is how easy it is to let yourself down versus letting your teammates down. If I was training alone, I would have the specter of other people in my boat. Like I had to be strong and in shape for Kathleen. I had to be strong and in shape for all the other women in the eight. I had to respect the effort that they were doing. At the Olympics my first time in Calgary in 1988, 
I thought I'd take it like any other World Cup race and I'd just waltz in there and I'm Brian Stemmel, I'm really good, thank you very much, just put the gold medal around me right now. And I put my poles over the wand and he, actually even before that, maybe like a minute before that, not much more, all of a sudden I went, oh my goodness, this is the Olympics and what am I doing, how am I going to win and, and really it took the energy out of me and just zapped all my confidence in one split second. All of a sudden I realized the magnitude of the Olympics. I, I made my professional debut there at 17 um, and I had my first, like my first start of the season came on the last day of the, the season and they were lifting the trophy that they won that year. And I started it and it was I think 56,000 people. And I was 17 years old. I, I couldn't speak for the first 50 minutes of the game. Like I couldn't say a word. I was just kind of looking around like, well, where, where am I? Like not realizing that this is, this is their regular, like this is every day. I'm gonna fast forward towards the end of my career. And that's kind of where I felt more pressure to be successful. And it was all in my own head where I felt like if I do slump, that's the end of my career. And I think I played until, I don't know, 44, 45. So as I got older, if I didn't produce in one game, he's too old. People start doubting you a lot quicker than a 22 year old who's new. Well, you didn't score in a game, no big deal. But when you're older, if you don't produce one game, automatically you're old, you're washed up. So I had to be mentally strong to convince myself that I can still play. I mean, I go from Dallas in 99 in game six when we have the chance to win the cup, you know, it's in the building and, and you're thinking, uh, oh my gosh, we're gonna, you know, we win this game, we win the cup. Uh, and then you fast forward two years later, 2001, and it's game seven against New Jersey. And I come in, I, I wasn't concerned about winning the cup, I was just concerned about winning the game. And it was said over and over again, let's win the period guys, let's win the period. And then if you win all the periods at the end of the game, you win the game. So um, I think uh, looking at my career in those two situations in game seven, or game six and seven to win the cup, uh, the nervousness because I hadn't done it and then going two years later to the point where I had won it and I was just like let's just play the game let's just win the game let's win the period you know let's come back after the first with a lead and then go from there I want or I hope for everyone to get a sense um, of realizing that we're always capable of more like that's gonna be my, my theme song uh, going into the Tokyo Olympics is um, the, the philosophy of more, you know, that every one of us, and it, it comes from this whole discussion on, on mental strength, uh, it's not just physical strength, but we're always capable of doing a little bit more. Whether we're going to try, uh, be, learn, or do a little bit more, there's, there's always like, just like a little, a little drop more that we can do. So when you're going through uh, a season and you have a bad game, are you a guy who is going to go home and you're going to think about it all night or are you going home and you're doing everything in your power to get away from it? Depends how bad the game was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Even within a game, you kind of have to get by it in the game. You forget about it in the game. But it's like the second the game is over, win or lose, any mistake you've made in the course of the game, any block that you've missed, pass that you dropped, whatever the case may be, you're you're running through it in your mind and you're thinking what could I have done differently. There were times where if a game was over at 11 p.m. at night I wouldn't go to bed until 6 a.m. the next morning squeeze in an hour and then I'm up back to practice working out the next day watching film with my teammates because I'm replaying every single play in my head whether it's good or bad what are ways that I can get better. Because again you had to leave it at the rink and as I got older I was better at leaving things at the rink but if you didn't then you you know, I always found it tough early in my career because that's all you did was think hockey, hockey, hockey. And at times when that's what, all you're thinking, when things aren't going well, you, you can't stop thinking the bad thoughts. And that's, as I got older, I started to realize, leave it at the rink. My wife was my hook partner. I think it's important for all of us as players to have hook partners as somebody you could talk to and get constructive feedback. And it helped that she didn't really like baseball a whole lot. So we never talked about baseball much. I'd come home, how you just didn't have your stuff tonight? I'd be like, yeah, I didn't have my stuff tonight. And it was the end of it. And I used to bring it home, I used to be mad when like, I wouldn't talk to my teammates, I wouldn't talk to my family or anyone. And then yeah, I just realized, like, damn, it's just a game, man. It ain't like, it's just, this is just my job. I understand I'm gonna fail at my job sometimes. It's the hardest job in the world. Like, hard, hardest sport in the world. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna be perfect. I'm not gonna get hit every time. I'm gonna fail majority of the time. So 
I'm just gonna go home and stay loose and go back the next day and try to do it again. I sacrificed three months out of the year to be away from my family, almost moving my family across country, the part of our lives that never get value, that people never even see. The fact that we're trying to be a dad to my boys that are getting older from 4,000 kilometers away, People don't value that, the hardships of what you sacrifice just in order to put food on the table. I used to like working. I used to work at Loblaws. And I used to like working Saturday morning and then driving to Buffalo and playing a game. I wouldn't have to think about anything. I just go and play. And that's when in my early 20s. Didn't think anything, just played lacrosse. You never want to get too high and you never want to get too low. And you know, so when, when things are going well, yeah, you enjoy it, but don't don't let it go to your head. And by the same token, when things aren't going so well, don't beat yourself up, don't kill yourself, and, you know, kind of keep your head on. I had just, like, finished a hard workout, and I'm just laying on the track, like, passed out. And I'm like, this sucks. I don't have to be here. And it was the scariest, like, thought that had entered my head because it was the first time ever where I started to think, like, okay, um, like, what am I doing? An elite athlete or a professional athlete, like, you're doing your dream job. Um, and, like, so many people, like, fight to get in that position to be there. So those moments, thank God, they're not often. They, they do come and it's normal and it's just understanding it's because it's hard. And if it was easy, everyone would do it. I never really looked at it as a grind. I always looked at it as, a, I'm, I'm still having fun. I'm doing what I love doing, and I'm just having fun. And I just get to play hockey games. Uh, uh, there was never never once in my career that I thought, well, this is a grind. Well, you gotta understand, I played lacrosse up until I was about 44, 45. And I did both until I was about 40, summer and winter. So it was a lot of lacrosse. I loved it. I don't have any regrets playing as much as I did. I wish I won more championships. I wish I played more. It wasn't. It wasn't tough for me. Like I, I enjoyed what I did, so I, I don't know what to say. I, I loved what I did. I have no regrets, and it wasn't challenging. You know, there's days where you're fighting for your life, for your job, or or you're fighting for ice time. Or, but you're in the NHL. Like I said every day you wake up and you go hang out with the best, with the best hockey players in the world. You come running out and, you know, my young one's screaming, Mike Medano, Mike Medano, as they're playing mini sticks. And Mike Medano goes and grabs a mini stick and starts playing with my kids. And, you know, you kind of, I come out of the room and I'm bummed out that I didn't play well. And then I go, this is pretty cool though. You know, my kids are getting an experience of a lifetime here, right? I said, yeah, this is, this is pretty good. This is a pretty good life I had. Winning or losing, it was, it was, uh, count your blessings, God, family and friends keep it there and have a good time doing it. And I did, and we did.